And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Penny Balkin Bach, Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Association for Public Art, formerly the Fairmount Park Art Association. A curator, writer, and educator who provides artistic direction for the organization, Penny Balkin Bach is well known for her work with artists and for her innovative approaches to connecting public art with its audiences. She supports the creation of opportunities for new work by artists and creative professionals, promotes the interpretation of art in public spaces and advocates for the responsible stewardship of public art. Penny has been a participant on numerous local, national and international public art juries and conservation advisory committees. She has served on the National Public Art Network Council, an advisory body to the Americans for the Arts, and she currently serves on the Mayor's Cultural Advisory Council of the City of Philadelphia, where she is chair of the city's Public Art Advisory Committee. Penny is the executive producer of Museum Without Walls Audio, a multi-platform interactive award-winning audio guide created to engage the public with Philadelphia's preeminent collection of outdoor sculpture. The author of the landmark book, Public Art in Philadelphia, she has written and lectured extensively about public art and the environment. In 2013, Bach received the National College Art Association's Public Art Dialogue Award for achievement in the field of public art and was the recipient of the inaugural Tyler Tribute Award for her, quote, unparalleled contributions to public art in the city of Philadelphia and to global awareness of the importance of art in our society. Penny received an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degree from Moore College of Art and Design. She's a BFA graduate of Temple University's Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia and received an MA in Visual Communications and Social Organization from Goddard College in Vermont. She pursued graduate studies in fine arts and designs at the Allgemeine Gewerbeschule in Basel, Switzerland. So I think we can tell from her bio that she is the perfect person to talk on the topic. And I welcome he, her now. Uh, her topic is Then and Now, Monuments, Memorials and Public Art. Penny. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you for inviting me to speak with you this evening. Um, hello, everybody out there. I still can't get used to the strange way of meeting together, but hopefully that will be improving soon. Uh, the topic that I will be discussing is very broad, um, but I hope it will give you an overall picture of the complexity that monuments, memorials, and public art really always have shared in the public consciousness. As symbols of collective memory, monuments and memorials have had very different meanings to those who erect them and those who inherit them. And I'll be speaking about that today. It's a complicated topic. It's controversial. It's sometimes very confounding. But public art is a tangible part of our public history and our evolving culture, especially here in Philadelphia. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that is. But with this recent powerful public awakening regarding what and whom we choose to honor, artists in public art really are uniquely positioned to reflect and reveal our society and our times. So I want to talk about four sort of mini topics. One, I want to give you a flash introduction to public art in Philadelphia. That way we're all kind of starting in the same place. And then I want to focus on three different sculptures in Philadelphia and also our Museum Without Walls audio program and how that relates to our understanding of public art in Philadelphia. I want to talk briefly about the national and international context, because that is so important today. And finally, I want to talk about new ways of participation and thinking about representation in the field of monuments, memorials, and public art. So that's a little map of what I'd like to cover really quickly in the short time we have available today. There's a saying, um, briefly, uh, what you see depends on where you stand. It actually comes from a C.S. Lewis quote. 
who says, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you're standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. This is a very relevant uh, idea as it relates to how people see public art today from different points of view. This is a work um, by the artist Felice Venini. Um, it's an anthro anamorphic installation at the Grand Palais in Paris that he did in 2013. And if you can see on the left, that's kind of basically one viewpoint of the artwork that he installed. But you can only see it come together from one particular place, and that's the image on the right. So the idea that um, we all see things differently depending on where we stand is really relevant to public art, and in this case, to this artist's work. So let's begin our flash introduction. You know, you know our Paleolithic ancestors incised, carved, painted images, and we know about the caves in Altamira, Spain, and at Lascaux, France, but closer to home, there were signs of human culture that were traced on a group of small rocks in the Susquehanna River in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. These are images of petroglyphs on Little Indian Rock from the Susquehanna River. Um, they're attributed to the Algonquin-speaking Indians who lived along the Susquehanna between 1000 and 1400. What is both tragic and interesting is that um, the state removed these petroglyphs from their original site, and they now can be seen in the Pennsylvania Historic Museum in uh, Harrisburg. The first public art organization in the United States was founded here in Philadelphia, and it was founded by a group of civic-minded people, and they established the Fairmount Park Art Association in 1872, and we will be celebrating our 150th anniversary next year. What's important, I think, to um, understand is that this was a citizens' movement. It was not a government program. Government public art programs were followed later, but this is a distinction that the Association for Public Art um, holds to this day. And um, the founders were two men by the name of Henry Fox and Charles Howell, um, and they were in their early 20s. These images are not of that era, but um, they enticed people from all walks of life, merchants, entrepreneurs, lawyers, arts professionals, and they held a common belief that placing works of art in public spaces would enable people to share equally in an improved civic environment. They really believed that public art should be available for anyone. Then some 30 years later, We'll see you yes. your first slide. Do you mind advancing your slides, Penny, to get to where you want to to see? I am. I'm so sorry. I'm looking at slide number seven. Penny, do slide. you Penny, do you think you could try something for me? Would you? Yes. Pop, do you think you could try to um, stop sharing and then reshare for me? I also am downloading your slides, so if I need to, I'll share for you. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing and and the same way we did before where you press that little icon on the right and you have that double request of sharing. Yes. And let me know when you walk through that and we'll make sure that, that we can see it, we can confirm. Do you see slides? Wonderful. Seven? So we right I see three individuals, two male yeah. and one female. No. Okay, and could you just okay. just for fun to make sure that we that we can all see here? Do you think you could advance just once for me to make sure that we Yes, perfect. Okay. I don't want to give anything away if you need to go back. <laughs> um, no. but we 
now. Let Thank me, you so much, Kevin. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. And no, no, I'm so sorry because I um I don't see what you all see. So thank you for checking in with me. Um, so if we go back to that flash introduction, this was the size, the um, slide of the um, petroglyphs on Little Indian Rock. The point being that art in the public domain has been with us really since the founding of our country. Um, and since times before our founding and Native American presence here um, in Pennsylvania. The um, three people that I mentioned, uh, the um, Henry Fox and Charles Howell, and uh, Ellen Phillips Samuel is the woman on the right. Uh, I was saying that they all held this uh, belief that art should be available to everyone. They um, there weren't really established museums in Philadelphia, although the Pennsylvania Academy was in existence at that time, but they felt that um, art should be in the public domain. Uh, Ellen Phillips Samuel on the right uh, came from a woman, she was a woman from a public spirited philanthropic family. She was an active association member, but she could not serve on the board, which was all male. But when she died in 1913, the association became the beneficiary of her residual, residuary estate, um, which is said to have been one of the largest um, such uh, bequests in the country at that time. And, uh, the early founders convinced Anthony Drexel to be the association's first president. He served for 22 years from 1871, and of course later founded Drexel University, but much later in 1891. And the sculpture of Drexel by Sir Moses Jacob Ezekiel was unveiled in 1905 in Fairmont Park. And that sculpture now can be seen on the campus of Drexel University. It was moved there in 1996. The 1876 Centennial Exposition set the stage really for the formation of the association. And one of their earliest projects was stimulated by a letter that they received from a very young French artist by the name of Auguste Bartholdi. And he offered to send a piece of a sculpture that he was working on to the United States. He offered to send what was the torch of the Statue of Liberty. And that you can see in the image on the right, um, the torch of the Statue of Liberty became the observation tower for the centennial here in Philadelphia. Today, um, the Association for Public Art continues this mission, and we commission and acquire work, we preserve, promote, and interpret public art. And this long and pioneering history really has been characterized by innovation and community engagement. And today I want to also illustrate how that history has affected current public art practice in Philadelphia and beyond. But in addition, public art has found support in many different ways over the years in Philadelphia. One of the things that has recently been discussed is how public art gets paid for and therefore how connected patronage is to the ability to pay for artworks. Well, in Philadelphia, following the assassination of President McKinley in 1901, the Philadelphia Inquirer initiated a public subscription to erect a memorial to him. They asked people to send in $1 bills. And over the course of time, they raised $50,000, which at the time was enough to build that memorial. So it does um, help us understand how there can be other ways to um, 
support public art other than um, individuals or organizations. On the right, um, you see a um, early design by Klaus Oldenburg. Um, it was his early design for the clothespin in Center Square here in Philadelphia. Um, he suggested memorializing the percent pro for art program that supported the commission. So as a typical tongue-in-cheek Oldenburg move, um, he was ad addressing really how public art may get funded in Philadelphia and beyond. Philadelphia actually has the two first percent for art programs in the country. One um, that is operated by the city that um, says that 1% of construction funds um, on city property should be allocated for public art. And the other that's run by the Redevelopment Authority here in Philadelphia that requires that developers create, um, have an obligation to um, commission new artworks for their properties. There are lots of more contemporary ways that public art now happens in the city. Organizations like the Mural Arts Program, Monument Lab, um, the universities in Philadelphia have collections of public art. Um, there are many community groups that are commissioning artworks. So there are lots of ways now that public art can happen in our city. One of the things I also like to think about is the enduring nature of public art. Uh, and there can be, be no better example than Albert Lessel's beloved billy goat installed by the association in the fair. It's as much a family landmark today as it was then. It's hardly monumental. It's tucked away in a pocket of the park, but you know the pleasure of it defies race, gender, class, and even age. So I'd like to focus on a couple of um, Philadelphia artworks that I mentioned before. And I want to introduce you to the J. Otto Schweitzer's All Wars Memorial to Colored Soldiers and Sailors. This sculpture was originally installed in a remote location in Fairmont Park in 1934. It has a disturbing and inspiring history that really, excuse me, <clears throat> Take just a quick sip. This disturbing and inspiring history really exemplifies the importance of telling the unvarnished stories behind public art, their works, their artists, their patrons, their antagonists, and their supporters. I encountered this sculpture in the 1980s. Um, in not very good condition. And then the association carried out initial needed conservation work, and the humanity of the monument was immediately stirring. Look at the difference between the work out in the park, not being taken care of, full of corrosion, and then the initial conservation that revealed the dignity of the men in uniform. I discovered um, through my research that the Honorable Samuel Beecher Hart, who was an African-American Pennsylvania legislator, was also captain of the Gray Invincibles. They were the last colored unit in the Pennsylvania militia. And he sponsored a bill to have a memorial created to honor the state's black military men who had served the United States in wartime. He intended the work to be installed on the parkway, but racist attitudes at the time caused the city's art jury to offer a compromise site tucked away in West Fairmount Park behind the Memorial Hall, which is the East Touch Museum, where it languished and remained hidden for 60 years. Now, African-American veterans knew where the sculpture was, but very few other people knew of its um, importance and its location. 
Samuel Beecher Hart's granddaughter, Doris Jones Holliday, was 10 years old when she pulled the cloth from the sculpture at the dedication. And you can see Mrs. Holliday on the right. Um, that's a photograph from the dedication ceremony, 1934. Who is represented and how is really a timely conversation around public art, an important one. Mrs. Holliday shared with me her family photographs. She and her sister visited that site every year on Memorial Day to lay a wreath. As they grew through adulthood. The sculpture was finally relocated to the parkway um, in Aviator Park across from the Franklin Institute in 1994. And there was a great celebration, children, veterans. At the rededication of, of the sculpture, I was approached by the woman on the left, Marie Murphy, whose great uncle was one of the models for the sculpture. I always assumed that they were real people, but I had no way of proving it at the time. But Mrs. Murphy showed me a ring that she was wearing and it matched the ring on the sculpture itself. Her great uncle had given her that ring. This is another example of the enduring nature of public art and how over time, people have different relationships and develop different relationships to the various artworks. I figured if Mrs. Murphy found me, that I could find others who were related to the sculpture in some way. These are the granddaughters of the artist, J. Schweitzer, who are also there at the dedication. Now, telling these stories became an important part of our mission. And the evolution of public art signage begins with that very handsome, but not very um, illuminating special bronze seal of the Fairmont Park Art Association. You can see it discreetly located on many of the historic sculptures um, from the 19th century. But today we've worked to create a unified interpretive signage program. And we began that in 2008. That's part of our ongoing program, which we developed called Museum Without Walls. That came about because our signage and educational consultants told us that we could only put 100 words on our sign, because that's how many words people would read on the street. Well, in reaction to that, we decided that there had to be a better way to tell these stories. Um, and among the privileges of working with an organization that's almost 150 years old is that um, we have continuity through our archival material and firsthand accounts. And we really wanted to share that, um, those stories with others. And our Museum Without Walls audio program does that. It's a multi-platform program. It's available online on site by mobile phone and, and also with an app. But, you know, even as we use and exploit our high tech options, and certainly this year has really pushed that to the limit, um, we also are favor face-to-face -face, um, uh, low tech resources. And we have a team of public art ambassadors, um, high school, college students um, who are attached to all of our projects. They bring public art to the public and especially to their peers and also to a new generation of supporters that we will need in the future. The Museum Without Walls audio programs um, enable you to walk down the parkway and hear these stories. Um, but they're not a traditional audio tour. We um, use a method that we call the authentic voice. We look for people who have a direct connection to the artworks. Um, and people have told us that listening to these audios, it, it's almost like eavesdropping into a fascinating conversation. 
So for example, the All Wars Memorial, you can hear from Charles Fuller, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of A Soldier's Play, and Michael Ropel, who was the, um, the, the force behind getting the sculpture moved in the first place. So I want to talk about another Philadelphia story, Frank Rizzo. I'm sure you all know some of this, but let's look at it from an objective point of view. The sculpture of Frank Rizzo was installed only seven years after his death, and it was largely through the dedication of his family and friends. And frankly, it was criticized from the very beginning. The sculpture became part of a national conversation, of course, around the fate of statues honoring Confederate generals and other racially charged figures in American history. Here on the left um, is Tony Auth's, I think, historic editorial cartoon um, that depicts Government of the People, which is a sculpture by um, Jacques Lipschitz uh, that the association was instrumental in completing for the city. And you also see Rizzo um, with the uh, clothespin in a very interesting position quote, called Art Treasures of Philadelphia. Now this irony uh, was um, not lost on our organization because uh, when the, the sculpture was placed in, um, in the MSB Plaza, it was placed in the shadow of government of the people, which Rizzo publicly despised. He called it a load of plaster. Some people say he called it a load of something else, but I wasn't there and I have no quotes. Now, what's interesting is that, as I mentioned, um, there were issues around the sculpture, literally from, from the moment it was installed. These photographs are not recent. You might think that they happened last year. But they didn't. Um, the photograph with uh, the sign Rizzo the Racist was from 2016. The other one with Black Power is from 2017. Finally, after public hearings and lengthy consideration, the city determined that the Rizzo statue would be moved when the renovation of the overall plaza took place in a few years. Ah, uh, wait, I think I'm missing this. I'm going to move ahead. Some things are out of order, I'm sorry. Um, the, sculpture, the photograph on the left is the police guarding the sculpture in 2018. And then finally, the removal of the sculpture in 2020. Uh, the mayor was very concerned about public safety. He decided that it was important to remove it as a public safety measure. I know some of you may ask what's happening with it. Um, it's currently in storage. And uh, at the moment, the Rizzo family is um, contesting the removal. And also, uh, there are discussions about where it may, may go in the future. So it is a very unresolved um, situation at the moment. Uh, Christopher Columbus. So Columbus, that statue of Columbus was originally placed in Fairmont Park as part of the 1876 centennial by the Italian community. Um, it was moved to Marconi Plaza, and um, in recent uh, years, with um, concern about uh, the commemoration of Columbus, there was concern from members of the community in South Philadelphia especially that the fate of the Columbus Monument would be the same as the statue of Frank Rizzo. And so neighbors took it upon themselves to protect the sculpture. And you are seeing correctly that there's a man holding a, a um, automatic weapon 
protecting the sculpture in Marconi Plaza in South Philadelphia. The um, decision was made not to remove the sculpture, but to box it. And uh, these are all sort of various attempts to try to figure out what to do about contested monuments. There, as you will see, as we continue to look at examples, there is no one answer. There's definitely not one solution. In this case, the city um, asked for uh, the public to um, weigh in on the fate of this monument. Uh, the idea of, of boxing it was to give it some time. The um, mayor was also hoping to reduce the tensions in Marconi Plaza. Um, and uh, this is another case of an unresolved monument uh, in Philadelphia. The um, members of the community have actually initiated court proceedings against the removal of the sculpture, and it's currently in litigation. So let's um, think about the national and international context of all of these questions surrounding especially contemporary um, monuments. As I said, there is no one answer. There are a lot of things that can happen. People react, then people can reflect. They might reveal something new that they didn't know about the sculpture. The sculpture might be removed. It might be relocated. It might be replaced by something else. It might be reinterpreted, it might be redefined in some way. There might be some kind of reconciliation that's possible, or it might be reconnected to its original um, roots in, 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 in its um, uh, commissioning. It might remind us of something really important in our past, um, sometimes uh, troublesome re reminders, but part of our history nonetheless or it might help us represent differently by thinking more uh, carefully about the ways in which we um, commemorate people and events. So, in July of 1776, after hearing the words of the Declaration of Independence for the first time, what happened? a crowd of soldiers and civilians tore down a gilt statue of King George III in New York City. So you might say our sort of founding moment had to do with responding to a monument and its message. And not too dissimilar to what happened in Charlottesville and the Robert E. Lee Monument and calling attention to um, issues surrounding that work of art and that person and that moment. Similarly, Black Lives Matter, that created another kind of image that is hard to forget, but in a very, very different way. And we respond in different ways. I show you this because it's an unusual point of view. It's a drone photograph of the Robert E. Lee Monument in Richmond, Virginia. What you're looking at is the graffiti around the base. That was an issue for all of the sculptures on Monument Avenue, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You know, sometimes people just get it all wrong. This is a sculpture on the apron of City Hall of um, Matthias Baldwin, who um, founded the Baldwin Locomotive Works. But um, someone defaced that sculpture with words murderer, colonizer, but 
Actually, Baldwin was an abolitionist. He established a school for African-American children in Philadelphia. So that does tell us something about um, public behavior, about understanding our past and um, what happens, and we're very familiar with that now, when um, people get um, out of control and frankly aren't thinking, thinking about the content, they're just thinking about their action. Sometimes public art can um, reveal things to us. This is beautiful sculpture by Randolph Rogers of Abraham Lincoln um, off of Kelly Drive. I'm sure you know it. Um, this was commissioned uh, by the Lincoln Monument Group not long after he was assassinated. It's a really important sculpture. It's often reproduced because Lincoln is shown holding a quill. He's shown at the moment that he's signing the Emancipation Proclamation. But what I'm going to show you next may surprise you. It certainly surprised me when I saw it. This was the first model that the artist submitted for that commission. Same artist, same um, commission. When it came to the Monument Association, they asked the artist to go back to the drawing board. Unfortunately, that's how we wound up with that really memorable sculpture of Abraham Lincoln. But this did not surprise me totally, and I'll tell you why. This was another sculpture, different artist of the time, Thomas Ball. Um, it's a sculpture that's uh, installed in Washington, D.C., and another cast of it in Boston. The one in Washington is actually in commemoration of Frederick Douglass, which is, you know, supremely ironic. But um, it shows us, I think, that there were certain canons that artists adhered to because they thought that's what the patron wanted. And that's what Randolph Rogers did until it was rejected and we gained something far better, far more important, far more artistically um, innovative. This is uh, one of the monuments um, on Monument Drive in Richmond, Virginia, which has been in the news for the last two years. It's a monument to J.E.B. Jeb Stewart, the, the Confederate um, general. And this is what happened to it and most of the monuments along Monument Avenue, to the point where all of the sculptures, except for Robert E. Lee, because of the pending court case, were removed by the mayor of uh, Richmond with the support of the governor. And off goes Jeb Stewart. We'll come back to this sculpture, so don't forget it. So what else can happen to these monuments? Well, this is Stalin, fallen Stalin in Monument Park in Moscow. Here he is, nothing more than a bench for some school children. There's a park in Hungary called Memento Park, uh, which is basically a park where all of the sculptures that were removed were placed in very um, unusual juxtaposition. But this is a really interesting uh, piece here, because what you're looking at are the boots of Lenin, which were left after the statue itself was destroyed. Sometimes it's possible to replace a sculpture. Um, the, uh, there's now been a, uh, a movement, and it sounds like it's going to happen, to um, swap 
this sculpture of uh, Taney um, for a sculpture by, of Thurgood Marshall. Um, Taney was most famous for his Dred Scott case, where he ruled that um, that Dred Scott was not a citizen by virtue of his race, so he had no right to go to court. So to honor um, that memory, um, people are beginning to realize that there are other um, ideas and and um, uh, ways to um, consider our past, and that works of sculpture, though they may seem permanent, may not necessarily be that permanent. Another way of addressing um, contemporary thought is by reinterpretation. Uh, this is Monticello and uh, Sally Hemings was um, a resident at Monticello, was um, probably one of the most famous and somewhat lesser known African-American women in American history. And, you know, she had been linked to Jefferson, but as more and more stories have come about, uh, Monticello has invited historians to come back to um, that location and rethink her relationship to both um, our country and to Thomas Jefferson. So the um, entire uh, narration now at Monticello really has expanded for the better. This is um, a uh, sculpture of Cecil Rhodes and in the UK. And more than 350 Oxford University academics have demanded that Cecil Rhodes be removed. Um, he, they, he, um, they feel that his um, relationship to uh, civil rights um, is something that should not be celebrated. And um, in the meantime, the sculptor Anthony Gormley uh, told the Financial Times something really interesting as an alternative. He suggested that they should leave the sculpture of Rhodes in his niche, but readdress our, their relationship to him. He would simply turn him to face the wall rather than facing outwards. He said that adjusting his position would mark an acknowledgement of the, the society's collective shame. As it turns out, Oxford University has opted to keep the controversial statue in place. Um, in terms of reconciliation, some artists have had some very interesting ideas. This is a work by Nicholas Galanin in, um, in it was created in Australia. And basically he um, dug the silhouette of the sculpture of Captain Cook um, and showed it all as a potential burial place for the sculpture itself. Sometimes it's possible over time to reconnect um, people with their own past and their own history. Um, it turns out that uh, the, mo the model for Frederick Remington's um, cowboy was a man by the name of Charlie Trigo, uh, who worked for Buffalo Bill's Bill Wild West show. Charlie Trigo was a local person from Chester County who had become the manager of Buffalo Bill's Wild, Wild West show. But what you see here um, is uh, information from uh, uh, the, the great, great nephew of Charles Trigo, and he published this photograph 
um, of his family and Trigo the model, uh, all of them standing in the farmhouse where um, Buffalo Bill Cody wintered some of his livestock. The Trigo name is actually well known in Chester County, but this sculpture also has a history of its own. Frederick Remington, who posed as um, a man of the Wild West, is known to har have spent hardly ever, hardly any time out there. But that's a story for another time. So we're going back to Jeb Stewart. Um, and I, I want to revisit him relative to the idea of representation. And I'll, I'll go fairly quickly now. Um, the um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts commissioned a sculpture by the artist Kehinde Wiley. Kehinde Wiley is well known for his portrait of, um, of Obama, which you might have seen his painting. And uh, his work often takes a look at historic artworks. And Kehinde Wiley took a look at that Jeb Stewart sculpture. And it gave him the idea to treat that idea somewhat differently. Uh, and so he placed upon a similar scale pedestal and a similar prancing horse a figure of a young black male, dreadlocks, torn jeans, sneakers. Oh, I'm sorry. I had some other photographs. And uh, you can see the effect that it had on the community. People of every race were out for the dedication of the sculpture, which I was privileged to attend, um, because it was an exciting moment. Now, at that time, the monuments still were in place on Monument Avenue, and the artist was not necessarily calling for their removal. But after this sculpture was installed and the other monuments came down, uh, the Kehinde Wiley sculpture really became an important centerpiece for the city of Richmond. So representation can mean other things too. Prospects for women making large scale sculpture were very limited in the 19th century. But the association actually commissioned Beatrice Fenton Seaweed Girl in 1920. That set the stage for opportunities for female artists in more contemporary times, such as Jody Pinto's 1987 Fingerspan. There's Jody working on it. You can see the uh, sculpture in the background. So again, who's represented, how it continues to be a timely conversation. Um, you can see here a uh, part of a contemporary work by Pepona Sorio called I Have a Story to Tell You. It's a casita or house-like structure that's composed of family photographs the artists collected from the community. And Osoria clearly shifts the narrative of who's typically commemorated. And these boys are standing in front of photographs of their grandparents. So quickly, I thought we would look at some other ways of thinking about public art and monumentality, um, different ways of representing and different ways people can share the public art experience. Um, community engagement is kind of a buzzword today, but it's really been going on for a very long time. Emmanuel Fremier's Joan of Arc on the left was commissioned in collaboration with the French community to celebrate their centennial. Um, on the right uh, is a community rededication of a Nandi, a sacred bull from India, which was along the Delaware waterfront. Now it's in storage awaiting a new location. An artist's practice may invite scrutiny of old habits. Um, so you can contrast the Philadelphia Home for Infants around 1900 uh, on the left with the artist Candy Coated's artist-designed sandbox and brilliantly colored sand. 
It's a visual delight. It was a temporary project for kids and their parents at the Oval, Oval um, on the Parkway. But projects like candies are important, not just for their innovation but and their visual delight, but also for their ability to bring people together for shared experience. That's how we meet together. That's how we play together. The idea of public engagement also isn't new. Um, in the summers, in the early 20s, they used to have these large scale municipal dances on the parkway. Thousands of people would come out and dance to the beat of the, of the police band. Reported, reportedly, there were thousands, 3,000 to 20,000 attendees. Um, they also had these dances when they dedicated sculptures. So when the Swan Fountain was dedicated, there was an evening of tango. And in 2012, we recreated that evening of tango at the Swan Fountain. Um, and again, this incredible um, opportunity for people to come together, people who didn't know one another, dancing the tango together. And public art really plays a role in creating the focal point and the opportunity for social gathering. Um, on the left, you can see students from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Chester Springs. Um, creating uh, sculptures uh, of animals from life. So we have um, created a 21st century version of that by having pro uh, events called Sculpture Zoo where we bring live animals and um, artists to locations like Logan Circle and Rittenhouse Square um, where Children can come and uh, make sculptures and see live animal sculpture um, uh, uh, demonstrations and sculpture making workshops. There are lots of different audiences that um, are out there for public art and we're trying to reach new audiences of all sorts. We're looking at a new breed of art lover. Um, and asked people to take and share photographs of their pups with sculptures. Now, while it might seem frivolous on the surface, people really took it seriously and they went out and found sculptures that were less well known to take photographs of their pooches. Um, and uh, there were various contests for, for, um, the owners, but one of the great things that we were able to do was to show their images at Dilworth Plaza on their digital broadcast screen. One of the things that um, these projects can do is that they help people look more closely at public art and, and memorials. That causes people to ask questions, to look more carefully, to think more um, specifically about our public environment. Another project that um, that we were involved with was uh, by Rafael Lozano Hemmer, a project called Open Air. It was an interactive light installation for the parkway. And 24 powerful searchlights were directed by participants' voices and their GPS locations. It was really inspired by the city's rich tradition of democracy and respect for free speech. Close to 6,000 messages were created and um, created a web page for each person with their messages and their comments. Each evening, invited community groups um, opened the night with their featured messages. We created an outdoor living room with comfortable inflatable furniture and again, invited people from all over the city to the parkway at night. What I can also say is that when we decided to do this, everybody said that no one would come to the parkway at night. That Aikens Oval, where we had our um, outdoor living room, was too hard to get to. And as you know, since this time, since 2012, when we did this project, um, there have been activities at that site at Aikens Oval 
um, every year. And now the city is rethinking the parkway as a whole. Another project um, called Fireflies by Tsai Gua Shang invited people also to actively experience the parkway. They were able to ride as passengers in a fleet of 27 custom-made pedicabs. These pedicabs were illuminated by thousands of colored lanterns that the artist uh, fabricated in his hometown in China. This was an opportunity for us to um, engage the Chinese community. All of our materials were bilingual. Um, with the artist on hand, uh, it was a great opportunity to enlist this social media and to build a project. And finally, a free public celebration kicked off um, this event. And then the social media ritual began. What I wanted to point out was that one of our most spirited guests was a woman by the name of Eve Rudin, a native Philadelphian. She wanted everyone to know that at the time, at 101 years of age, she was older than the parkway. And finally, um, you know, these projects involve a cross-section of people, many young people. It used to be that you would think of an artist working in isolation in the studio or with, you know, a, a small team of fabricators who were helping the artist cast an artwork. Now, depending on the nature of the work, there can be teams of people behind every artwork. And um, when we recruited our multicultural team, uh, one of the drivers told me that he found out about the opportunity through Craigslist. I knew someone was going to ask me about Rocky, and uh, I just wanted to say that this is my favorite photograph of Rocky. Rocky is wearing a t-shirt or a sweater that says, go see the art. So I just wanted to add that you can find out more about public art, monuments, memorials on our website at the Association for Public Art.org. You can also become a member because we're a membership organization. And you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's